So for those of you that um, I haven't met, my name's Daniel Bosco. As you know, we're um, running these webinars uh, every day, 11 a.m. Uh, Sydney time, and then again at 1 p.m. Uh, Sydney time. Uh, different topics each day. Uh, today, we're gonna to be talking about basement waterproofing. And this is all part of our webinar isolation series, helping to keep us connected uh, during isolation and, and maybe cover off some topics and give us the opportunity to pick up something new along the way. All right, so Australian um, experience for basement waterproofing has been a little bit mixed uh, to date. And there's a few reasons for that, um, mostly because there isn't actually a current Australian standard for underground waterproofing, believe it or not, um, even though we're flooded with standards in other areas. And this happens to be a, a fairly challenging area um, for building construction as well. So um, quite surprising that we haven't been able to put something to, to paper on that uh, to date. Uh, we've had significant failures reported in the media, particularly recently in Australia, and a lot of that does revolve around um, waterproofing defects, which is such a big part of um, defects in building. Uh, and it really boils down to what I think is a, a lack of training and guidance for architects and engineers in terms of designing new buildings and being able to have the right input in terms of detailing. So we're going to run through a few of the details today and um, hopefully build on some of that, uh, that knowledge and experience and, and discuss some of the issues that are faced uh, out on sites when it comes to building waterproofing. So why do we need uh, dry basements? So it's a really big part of health and safety for residents and users of, of the building. Uh, obviously mold and moisture um, have a, a negative effect uh, on, on health. Uh, there's also durability and serviceability issues. So yeah, it can create slippery floors um, at entrances. It can also corrode not only the concrete structure because water's coming in, but services around those lift wells and shafts and the like. Uh, getting water into those areas can really degrade a building fast. And there's a really high cost of rectification and maintenance that's associated with waterproofing. Uh, often quoted is the statistic that Waterproofing is less than around one or two percent of the total construction cost, so a very, very small component of, of the construction cost, but ends up resulting in 80 to 90 percent of the defect rectification costs. So something to consider, maybe it doesn't cost that much more to do a really good job of waterproofing and save yourself a lot of money in terms of rectification and also that reputation um, of the builder as well uh, in the long term. So there are two types of, of basements, you can categorise them either as a drained basement, and that's where you have the drainage uh, system, as you can see in that photo there on the floor, a, a cell type drainage where the water is actually allowed to flow in, go down to drains, and then it's pumped away or, or drained out um, to, to storm water. And then there's also the tanked basements, and this is where it's like a pool, you completely tank it, you've got membrane all the way around, up around, fully sealed off, and hydrostatic head is allowed to build around the basement structure itself. So obviously that requires a much higher level of, of water tightness. And it's important to know which one you're, you're dealing with before you start. As I said, there's no Australian standard, but there are some international standards that can be referred to for underground waterproofing and a range of them that we refer to uh, here in Australia. One that's come up more often recently is the BS8102, which has really good guidance on dryness levels that you're trying to achieve. So a really good description on how dry we want our basement to be, why we want it to be dry for the type of use and that. But it, the problem with BS8102 is it doesn't give us a lot of indication on how to achieve that. And, and it's actually a little bit of a lightweight in terms of particularly tanked basements and deep basements where you're going to have water pressure building. It's more designed for small residential buildings where they may be drained. And it actually says within the document itself, for tank basements and where water pressure is building, we refer to some of the European codes, which are a little bit more robust in that area. Uh, trouble is that I think BS8102 does get uh, lent on quite a bit uh, here in Australia and also in Asia as well for guidance where in areas where it might not be completely appropriate. On the other hand, then you have the European standards, which are more designed around deep tunnels and large structures, which are a little bit more civil engineering orientated rather than building orientated. They're great because they provide really good guidance uh, in terms of how to waterproof and the detailing, but um, they don't always provide as much guidance on dryness and, and have as much consideration for the built um, and building environment. 
So it's a little bit of a two extremes and something in the middle being needed when you look at the, uh, the international standards. So just a, a, a little comment, I like to call it the elephant in the room. I think it's something we, as those of you who know Bluey, we do a lot of work in civil engineering uh, and tunnels and, and underground structures. And we also do work in the, in the building industry as well. And I think the difference between the two, um, if I had to pick one large difference is the way it's approached by the client. In civil, everybody recognizes that a failure is bad for everyone. So it's a little bit more of a team effort in making sure that you have a successful outcome. Whereas in the building industry, it's a little bit more of a uh, transfer of responsibility. So there's more emphasis on the, on the warranty that's provided. Um, there's less clearly defined expectations and goals. Um, and you know the builder is, is gonna throw their hands up in the air and, and put it all back on the, on the waterproofing applicator if it goes wrong. And that doesn't always provide a really good outcome. What we're saying is that it's much better if people work together on a good outcome. Uh, we don't rely completely on the warranty because a warranty is not a guarantee that it's gonna go well. You can't transfer that responsibility. Um, so a little bit more collaboration, and working out the details and coming up with common solutions, I think provides a better outcome. Just a little bit on engineering input, uh, you know, the waterproofing specification writing, there's a whole series of activities that have to take place to, to create a dry structure. Starting with that specification writing, referring to international standards, doing the detailed design and picking up as many of those details as possible before you start construction so that you're not trying to design things on the run. Uh, you know, having input into the structural design as well, because there may be changes that are actually needed to the design of the structure to accommodate the waterproofing. Uh, and that sounds like it's a little bit extreme, but it can actually provide much, much better outcomes in, in the long run. Um, integration of the construction methods and sequence, choosing the piling types, for example, terminations and other things before you start. And then, of course, once all of that is selected, overview and monitoring of the works all the way through. So it really does start early in the project. As an example, uh, Wynyard Walk, which involved a building and a tunnel uh, project, which was completed a few years back. Uh, you know, we were involved with the engineers five years before that project started with all of the design detailing because it was such a complex structure. Eventually the project started and it all went very quick, but five years of work went into the planning for that project. So in terms of product selection, there's, there's a lot of options and probably more options when it comes to building basements than what there are in civil engineering applications because the type of construction is so varied and you're talking about, you know, above ground works that have to be integrated with below ground work, some drain, some tanked, varying levels of depth. And the types of things that we consider when we're selecting a type of waterproofing system is the continuity of the membrane that's required, how we're gonna terminate, how we're gonna do with penetrations. We have a think about the conformity to the substrate and the environment. So how flexible does it need to be? Um, is there a lot of three um, dimensional curvature and things that need to be dealt with? How complex is the structure? Um, detailing of the construction joints is important. So depending on the type of construction um, that's being used there, how much movement is in those construction joints will determine the types of systems that are used there. Uh, post installation protection, you can see there in the photo, um, you know, steel reinforcement being laid down over the top of the membrane. How can we protect that membrane um, during the activities that occur between putting the membrane down and the concrete being cast? Um, and then, of course, repair and maintenance at the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through the three or four main types of waterproofing solution and just have a think about each of those six items and how those different solutions apply. So first of all, looking at sprayed applied membrane. It's a fully continuous membrane, doesn't have joints and uses bonds for term, bond for termination. So when it comes to getting to the end of, of a spray applied membrane, it terminates itself effectively because it's highly, highly bonded. It conforms to highly complex geometry. That's actually one of the advantages of a spray applied membrane, as you can see in the photo there. Uh, lots of uh, dimensional changes, it copes quite well. Um, in that environment. It's fully bonded when applied to the structure. So that's another advantage. In other words, the water can't move laterally between the membrane and the concrete structure. So if you have a hole in one spot, it's not gonna travel longitudinally. Um, we also um, have some disadvantages. It, it's very limited in its movement capacity. And I'll talk about the engineering behind that uh, later in this presentation. 
but effectively because it's so heavily bonded as the cracks open up underneath uh, that membrane, it's quite challenging for that membrane to elongate and, uh, and to stretch. Not impossible, but a bit more challenging. Um, the membrane can be protected from other trades. So we can put blinding layers down, we can put other things down to protect it and repairs are possible depending on the access that we have available to us um, to get in there and repair it. Bonded membrane systems are an interesting one. Um, so they're covered quite heavily in BS8102. And I think certainly they have their place in, in the building industry. Uh, and if you're looking for the holy grail of, of waterproof membranes, then a bonded membrane makes sense because on paper, if you have a bonded membrane, um, then if you get a hole or a defect in one area, then the water won't travel laterally to other areas. Uh, the problem with that is even though it is, you know, the, the ultimate outcome for a waterproofing membrane, there's too many compromises that have to be made at the moment with the current systems that are available to create a completely dry structure and to use these products effectively. So in other words, they sound really good on paper, but practically in use, they don't work. Um, and the reasons for that is that the sheets aren't welded uh, together. So you have sheets that are just over a metre wide and the strips of, of membrane themselves are just overlapped. So there's every opportunity for concrete to get between those, for those um, the joints to come apart uh, during concrete pours while steel reinforcement and people are walking over the top. There's no termination system. So you can see in that photo there, the membrane comes up the wall. It can't be bonded back to the, the piles. And that occurs whenever you have um, tension piles within it, um, double corrosion protection anchors, uh, any other type of discontinuity. The only way you can actually terminate that membrane is by using a liquid membrane, which isn't a really effective way of terminating membrane. They're also only suitable for very basic geometry. So again, you can see in the photo there that it's not working real well where you have three-way curvature, just because you can't cut and weld each segment to kind of lobster back the, the membrane around curves. Uh, and I'll show you some, some other photos with other examples. I mean, there, there's a photo there of a bonded membrane being terminated to piles. You can see it's just a liquid membrane that's being applied. Anyone could probably walk up to that and just peel it off the surface pretty comfortably. It's not going to take a high load of, of back pressure. And there are better ways of terminating um, membrane. So the advantage is, as I said, it, it, is that it's bonded when it's applied to the structure. Um, the construction joint design is also a, a little bit questionable because it's a bit independent of the actual lining. So the water stops don't get welded to the membrane. So they're acting independently, which makes them a lot less reliable. And there's no protection available following in, um, the installation. So you can see here in this photo, um, that membrane has been laid, uh, the steel fixes have walked across the surface and there's quite a bit of contamination that's got onto that uh, membrane. And that's made the bonding system a lot less effective. So without that bonding system in place, you also now have joints that aren't welded and a completely exposed system, um, which was relying on that bond. Uh, which now won't be able to perform uh, as hoped. It's also very difficult to repair these systems uh, afterwards. And you can see here, this highlights a number of issues. This is where the membrane comes into the diaphragm wall. You've got independent water stop, which isn't looped, um, which is an issue within itself. And you've also got this little black bitumen um, bond, which is uh, terminating the membrane to the diaphragm wall. And considering the amount of movement that's going to occur at that location, that's a completely inadequate detail um, for the type of structure that's being built. So as you can see, bonded membranes look good on paper, but they really don't pull together an entire system when it comes to construction um, and in the real world of being out on site. Uh, sheet membrane systems, a lot more tried and tested, um, like spray membranes have their place. Um, they're fully welded sheets. Uh, and they have engineered terminations, which we'll talk about. They're suitable for complex geometry, so they can be applied in three-way curvature. If the substrate's wet, if the substrate is coarse, it's going to be a lot more accommodating. They're compartmentalised with water stop, so under BS8102, they're actually classified as partially bonded. Um, so they do have that feature of being able to compartmentalise leaks, and you can see there in the photo those black strips of water stop, which is compartmentalising. So if you get a hole in one area, it's going to contain that leakage to that um, to that small area, which can then be addressed and um, treated. They have very high movement capacity around construction joints, very good ability to bridge cracks, 
and they're able to be fully protected following installation, which is important. They don't need to be left exposed like a bonded membrane because we're not relying on that surface bonding to the structural concrete. So we can actually lay over the top of the membrane, either a blinding layer or a protection membrane to, to protect it. It can be completely independent of the structure. And there's also backup repair systems. So, I mean, clearly that is the preferred choice for, for basements, particularly where you have uh, a tanked uh, structure. So we're gonna go into a little bit more detail on these systems um, in a moment. I just wanted to mention before we move on to that, uh, concrete additives. Um, so concrete additives are used in, in some projects as a form of waterproofing. They rely um, quite heavily on crack control within the concrete. So the structure has to be designed to limit the crack width to less than around 0.2 millimetres for them to be effective. So it's quite an expensive exercise to increase your, your steel reinforcement to a level high enough to stop those crack widths increasing above 0.2 because most suppliers of the concrete additives won't warrant a crack. Uh, beyond that width. They don't offer any protection to construction joints and movement joints. So not really a, a completely adequate system on its own for, for water tightness. Um, good for durability of the structure and probably protection of reinforcement where you have small crack widths. We spoke about concrete cracking in our presentations earlier this week. Uh, you can go back to our website and have a look at that. We all know that concrete is designed to crack. If it does crack, Concrete additives can be useful in terms of the durability outcomes, but probably not so much in terms of the waterproofing outcomes from providing a total system. So just diving a little bit deeper into, into sheet membranes, as I mentioned, every joint is heat welded. And you can see there in that bottom photo, we, the choice is to do a double seam weld. And uh, the two photos there, one with the welding machine, shows how that welding is done. It's a double seam provides an air channel in between and that air channel can be tested. So it's a fully tested seam, pressure tested, and the seam itself is stronger than the original membrane. So it's a fully sealed tanked system. There are systems available for penetrations to allow for drainage and post injection. So you can actually penetrate through the membrane and have a seal across it. And I'll talk a little bit more about how those terminations work and the design behind those. There's systems available for conduit penetrations. This is obviously a, a challenge in buildings where you have PVC and HDPE uh, conduits coming through. There are different ways of sealing those depending on the makeup of the cluster of those conduits as they come through and also the materials that those conduits are made of. So treating PVC conduits versus treating HDPE conduits will be different and may actually determine which type of membrane you select depending on how important that issue is. There's anchorage systems that go through these membranes uh, and create a complete seal around. And these are important where you might need to fix uh, formwork uh, through to the rock strata behind or through to the piles uh, where you may have to hang services and other things later down the track. You can actually penetrate through the membrane and still have a fully sealed system um, with either the BA anchors, as you can see in the top photo, or the GRP anchors, which carry a higher load uh, showing in the bottom photo. A little bit more about terminations. So these are really important where you're terminating against diaphragm walls, for example, where you have openings in the structure, where the membrane is coming to an end and it actually needs to be terminated. And that's achieved by using a pressure gasket. So you can see there in the photo, that's a steel band um, over the top and that's uh, bolted into the concrete structure and there's a rubber flange behind, a rubber gasket behind which gets compressed and um, creates pressure. And the idea is to create two times the amount of pressure in that gasket of the water pressure you're trying to resist. And that's actually an engineering um, solution and a calculation. And we go through and we actually use finite element analysis to work out the thickness of the plate, the spacing behind between the bolts, um, and how tight those um, fixings need to be to be able to create that pressure. And we can also work out the um, type of gasket that needs to be used, so the thickness and the shore A hardness to be able to achieve that um, water pressure sealing. So a typical 80 metre design, which is obviously going to be pretty extreme for a building site, um, but you know it can obviously be um, toned down for, for, for lower depths, but you'd be looking at a 10 millimetre thick plate, 100 millimetres wide, the gasket of 50 to 65 shore A hardness and it would probably be compressed to about 50% of its thickness and that would seal against up to 10 bar of, um, of water pressure. So these systems are designed to create 
um, watertight structures in very extreme water pressure situations. And how do we use those? So we obviously use them, as I said, in diaphragm walls and openings in structures, but also in pile terminations. So piles um, you saw in the photos earlier with a bonded membrane, uh, and this was typical for most types of membranes, not just bonded membranes. Previously, going back a decade or two, you bring the membrane up to the pile and you paint something around and try and get it to bond, or maybe you try and put a band around it, but it was really challenging because the top of the pile is usually damaged from the breaking down to its level. Uh, water would be coming up through the pile. And then how do we terminate that membrane? Well, now we actually use gaskets, pressure gaskets, and we design those uh, to resist the water pressure um, on the structure. And this is how we do it. We use those terminations for diaphragm walls, pits and openings uh, as discussed. So you can see a few different um, applications there of how that's done. And then we also have bonded um, or adhesive termination. So we can use an epoxy um, to bond the membrane down to the structure. These can be used where you don't have very high pressure, um, say in the diaphragm wall termination where the diaphragm wall is reasonably dry, you can use an epoxy. Obviously they don't work as well on a damp surface. So then you'd be moving back to a, a pressure termination in that case, we had a lot of water around. And also they don't cope with movement really well. So it has to be a, a fairly stable um, environment that you're applying this type of, um, type of termination. So wherever you're expecting maybe movement in piles, you probably wouldn't go for this type of termination because it doesn't have a lot of flexibility, not like the pressure termination. But for diaphragm walls, in most cases where the diaphragm walls are dry, this can be an adequate um, termination detail. We also have terminations around anchors. Again, probably a more recent uh, innovation in being able to seal around double corrosion protection anchors. And these are becoming more common in basements now to resist uplift where you have uh, steel anchors uh, down into the strata and they come up and they have a plastic sheathing around them as you can see in the two photos and then that sheathing has to be connected to the membrane system. A really large project undertaken uh, over on Barangaroo station as part of Sydney Metro at the moment and this um, solution is now being applied across a lot of the basement uh, structures that we're working with where they have uh, tension piles. It's a fully sealed system, it's tested and has a lot of movement capacity um, for when the structure moves um, later in its life. But it is only possible to do this with VLDPE only because VLDPE is a type of membrane. There are a couple of different type of plastics that you can use for sheet membrane. But VLDPE um, being a very low density polyethylene is compatible with HDPE, which is the high density polyethylene, which is what the sheathing is made of. So it allows those two products to be welded together. Substrate. Um, suitability is something that needs to be considered when selecting your, your membrane type because as I mentioned we have PVC type membranes which are a little bit more flexible. VLDPE is a little bit more rigid so if you have a complex structure you may be leaning towards um, PVC and you can see there three-way curvature is pretty common um, but having welded joints and flexibility really helps you to provide that continuity of membrane in high risk areas and particularly when you've got a good applicator who knows what he's doing and knows how to weld. You can even see that um, something it's a steel pile coming out there uh, just off to the side of those guys and the membranes being able to be welded around that um, actually maybe a dewatering point uh, there and the membranes being welded around it temporarily. So you can see very very easy to conform to a structure. So suitability for the application also um, needs to consider the underground environment and this is where you start differentiating between you know roof membranes and basement membranes when you're down in the basement it can be wet there's moisture coming in um, water this is obviously an extreme photo here but you know it's not uncommon to see this type of thing in a basement where you have water ponding and really difficult to go and select things like spray applied membranes or fully bonded membranes when you're dealing um, with this type of um, type of situation. So the membrane system that you select really needs to be appropriate for the application. Compartmentalization is another thing just to touch on and it falls into internal and external compartmentalization. Internal compartmentalization is the water stop that you can see there in the photo. So that's in loops, uh, it prevents the internal lateral transfer of water between the structure and the, the membrane. It needs to be fully welded to the membrane and the water stop itself needs to be um, needs to be welded, not glued together, which sometimes you see. 
the ribs actually provide a mechanical bond to the concrete and the water is forced to travel around the ribs, increases the path length and also provides a lot of resistance from that water traveling laterally. You can see there in the photo, um, quite small compartments, a hole in one area means that the water won't travel to, um, to other compartments. External compartmentalization on the other hand is to prevent the transfer of water uh, between the membrane and outside the structure. And that could be important where you have um, a, a creek or a water feature um, or something around the basement that you don't want draining into other areas or where you have a tanked part of a structure moving to a drained part of the structure and you need to compartmentalize between those two areas. So what you're trying to do is stop water traveling outside of the membrane system. And usually you achieve that by either epoxy bonding the membrane down to the substrate or providing another type of um, connection, depending on the complexity um, and how much water that you're trying to stop transfer. But there is, um, there is that available as well. Protection systems, as I mentioned, really important once the membrane is installed to protect it from damage. Afterwards, I should point out that when you see the membrane in these photos, so you see the, the blue and the, and the light gray blue um, color of the membrane, that's actually a very thin film of membrane over the top of a black membrane. And that's designed to be a signal layer. And the signal layer acts as an indicator when the membrane is damaged. So if somebody scrapes that membrane or um, you know, runs into it with a steel bar or a car or whatever it is, it'll scrape off that very thin layer of color and expose the black behind. And it's really obvious that there's some damage there that needs to be addressed. We hope that that never happens because we provide really good protection to the membrane. And you can see in the three photos there, concrete blinding layer, um, 40 or 50 millimeters thick across the surface. So that once that membrane is laid, tested and signed off, there's no further damage that can occur to it. And the other trades can come in and work across the top. And this is a real advantage of a sheet membrane versus a bonded membrane. With a bonded membrane, you can't do this because the chemicals in the surface of the membrane have to be connected to the structure. So another reason why, as I've mentioned, a sheet membrane is preferable for these large basement applications. So just touching as we come to the end, some details to be considered um, during application and design. Coming back to the water stop, the water stop actually needs to be robust enough for the application. And you often see small water stops, you know, that might be 150 millimetres wide, where you've got large structures and deep pores. You know, water stops come in, you know, variable thicknesses, you know, commonly used up to 500 and 600 millimetres wide. Get as much of that water stop into the structure as possible. If you can have three bars on one side and three bars on the other side, biting into that structure over a length of 200 millimetres on each side, that's going to give you a much better outcome than having 80 millimetres on each side. So it needs to be robust enough for the application. They also need to be installed in continuous loops. I mean, it seems obvious, but it, it's surprising how often you see something like in the photo there on the right hand side with the blue water stop, where the water stop just runs to a wall and stops. What happens there is that the water will get into the end of that water stop and it'll just travel along and the water stop ends up providing a conduit for water flow it actually makes the situation worse unless you actually have your, your water stop in loops and being tied off and sealed um, to compartmentalize then it really doesn't add much value to the entire waterproofing system and then as i mentioned earlier as well just looking at that other photo there you can see their water stop which has been glued together rather than heat welded and you can see that it's starting to come apart and that's not a really robust system. I mean, they had just used a, um, a sealant effectively to, to join that water stop together. And we're talking about some pretty high profile projects that these photos have been taken on. So they're not small, small projects. Um, again, piles and anchors, we need to pay more attention to the, the details. We want to use engineered details that have actually had, you know, calculations and uh, testing done on the pressure resistance. You know, I'm, I'm kind of being a little bit tongue in cheek here saying goo doesn't seal, but then you look at the photo and that's exactly what's happened here. You know, someone's just put some gunk around the bottom of the pile and they're hoping that that's gonna seal. Nobody can say, you know, put an engineering cap on and say, yes, that will seal against 30 meters of water head. They're just hoping that it does. We also just finally need to allow for repairs and maintenance, no matter how good your, um, your waterproofing system is, you should always have injection hoses and other things looped into the system so that later down the track, if there is some damage that occurs in 20 years time, there is an option available to come in and inject some resin and actually 
um, seal the system off, particularly when you're in a tank structure, which has a lot of water head, there's high risk um, and consequences of failure. These are a really cheap, easy insurance policy um, to be installed because at the end of the day, nothing's perfect and you can't always predict what's gonna happen in the future of a structure. Hydrophilic joint seals is something you see used a lot in the, in the building industry, less in civil engineering. They rely on expansion uh, in contact with water to create compression uh, in the joint. The amount of compression that's created, let's call it uncontrolled, um, you hope is enough to resist the pressure. As we learned from compression seals, you need two times the amount of pressure in that joint um, of the water pressure you're trying to resist. Uh, you don't know that you're going to get that because you don't know how much that joint is going to open up and you don't know how much that hydrophilic seal is going to expand and how much pressure it's going to create over the life of the structure. So we would say that that's not a suitable outcome for joints with high movement and they're fairly unreliable in large structures where you're going to have, um, have those large movements. So not the product of choice when it comes to, um, to sealing joints. And finally, just a, a word on crack bridging. Um, spray membranes, as I mentioned, do have their place um, and can be quite a useful tool. But one thing to consider is that um, the properties are really important when it comes to a spray membrane. And it's often the properties that are most important that are overlooked a little. I, I often hear people say, oh, this membrane's really good because it has high bond. High bond actually works against you in, the, in a spray membrane. I also hear people referring to percentage elongation. Percentage G elongation doesn't help you at all when it comes to a spray membrane. What you need is you need the membrane to be thick enough so that it develops enough tensile strength to be able to bridge that crack. And you can see in the diagram above what you're looking for is the membrane to debond over a length so that it in increase that stretch length that you see there in the diagram as wide as possible. The wider that stretch length where it's debonded, then the more chance you've got of that membrane being able to bridge that crack because it's got enough strength in the tensile forces that are developed to hold together and the modulus of elasticity, not the percentage elongation, the modulus of elasticity will help you because what that'll do is that'll limit the amount of force that's created for the amount of stretch that you're getting. So they're the important things, modulus, low bond, high tensile strength, high tensile strength comes from uh, tensile capacity multiplied by the thickness. So you can see there in the bottom photo, that's how you create um, crack bridging and you can see there in that photo very fine line where the membrane has debonded but it has very high tensile strength and has been able to hold together over the, um, the bridging of that crack. So just a, a final note on crack bridging and spray membranes. So just in summary as we finish up, um, waterproofing should be treated as an engineering solution because that's exactly what it is. Uh, there are some international standards that can provide assistance uh, with the design but they're not um, completely useful. We don't have an Australian um, waterproofing standard yet for, for underground basements. And um, successful sealing, it sounds so obvious, just relies on all of those small details being addressed and, um, and correct. So thank you for your, um, your time on that. That's the uh, end of the presentation. Uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to either unmute and um, ask away or type something uh, in there for us. We're happy to consider that. Thank you again for joining us. I uh, hope to see you again either this afternoon or tomorrow. Appreciate your time.